Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. Welcome everyone to my airplane design tutorial number 12. In my last video I was showing you airfoil selection criteria so that you can find airfoils that are suitable for the mission of the airplane. In this one we are still looking at the wing. It's something I have mentioned a number of times. The aerodynamic center and the mean aerodynamic cord. Putting it in very simple terms, the aerodynamic center of a wing is something like a center of gravity and it can be determined purely from the geometry of the wing. I will start out with a 2D airfoil in order to explain what this is and what, is needed, what it is needed for. As we have seen in the tutorial on airfoils, as the airfoil angle of attack changes, the pressure distribution around the airfoil changes. The whole pressure distribution can be integrated into one resultant force vector which is acting at the center of pressure of the airfoil. If the angle of attack increases, the center of pressure moves forward and the amount of lift increases. If the angle of attack decreases, the center of pressure moves aft and the amount of lift decreases. As the position of the force vector varies with angle of attack, it creates a moment around a point we can select. We could use the leading edge, but there is a more suitable point and we will call it the aerodynamic center. The aerodynamic center of the airfoil, which we selected, is the point where the pitching moment stays constant. For symmetric airfoils in subsonic flight, the aerodynamic center is located approximately at 25% of the cord from the leading edge of the airfoil. This point is described as the quarter cord point. For the most part, the aerodynamic center does not change location with variations in angle of attack. This makes it a very convenient point for subsequent analysis, for example longitudinal stability. A rectangular unswept wing has a line of ACs that all lie at the quarter cord points. If that was all we ever had to deal with, we could stop the video right here because the wing AC simply lies on that line at mid-span for each wing. But a lot of airplanes have something other than a rectangular wing. Some can have very complicated shapes. All we want to know is where the AC is for a particular wing, regardless of its plan form. We don't really want to deal with complicated wing shapes, so engineers have decided, for the purpose of further analysis, to substitute the real-world tapered swept wing with a simple rectangular wing of the same area that has its AC in the same location. This is called the equivalent wing. The y or spanwise location of the AC is calculated with a formula that is used to find the center of gravity of a trapezoid. The mean aerodynamic cord, or MAC, is then simply the cord of the trapezoid at that location. The x-coordinate of the AC is at the quarter cord point. Now we can calculate the equivalent wing span, which is simply the wing area, which by definition is the same for both wings, divided by the MAC. If the wing consists of multiple tapered sections, Use the same formula as it is used to calculate a center of gravity, but with the panel areas instead of weights, to get the overall wing AC location. By the way, the mean aerodynamic cord is not necessarily the same thing as the mean wing cord. The mean wing cord has, has a much simpler definition. Dividing the total wing area by the wing span gives you the mean wing cord. As an example, I have used the tapered wing in this sketch and calculated the AC position and from it the MAC. With that information I can draw in the equivalent wing. The whole point of the exercise is that the AC is the same for either wing. So now we can use the equivalent rectangular wing for subsequent calculations. The center of gravity position of an airplane is expressed in percent wing MAC. I have drawn in the CG at a fuselage station of 20 inches. The equivalent wing leading edge is at the 13.38 inch station, so the CG is 6.62 inches aft of the equivalent wing leading edge. We divide this by MAC and get 0.142 or 14.2%. One example where this is needed is the longitudinal stability analysis. 
I have mentioned in a previous video that the distance between the airplane center of gravity to the airplane aerodynamic center defines how stable the airplane flies in pitch. The larger this distance is, the more stable the airplane flies. We will just say here that a longitudinally stable airplane requires a pull to increase the pitch angle and a push on the stick to decrease the pitch angle. If the stick is held in the new position, the airplane will settle at a, s at a slower speed after a pull and a higher speed after a push. An airplane that requires a larger stick movement or elevator deflection, let's say for a change in speed of 20 knots, is more longitudinally stable than one requiring a smaller stick movement. What I am showing here is flight test data, where I measured the elevator deflection for flaps up and flaps at landing deflection, both at idle and full throttle. We can learn several things from this chart. First of all, the airplane is very stable because it requires a lot of elevator deflection for a speed change. Second, the data shows that these are not straight lines but curves, with steeper slopes at slow speed and a shallower slope at a higher speed. If I had extended the measurements to even higher speeds, the curve would have flattened out even more, until it required only a small deflection for a, for a large speed change. This is undesirable, but partly compensated for by the higher stick forces at higher speed, meaning you have to push harder at 130 knots for a pitch change than at 60 knots. For good flying qualities, it is desirable that for speed changes, besides having large enough stick deflections, that you also have good stick force gradients. The next thing we can learn from this chart is that, for example, to fly at 60 knots, it requires different elevator deflections, whether you fly with flaps up or down, or with power at idle or full throttle. This means that flap and power changes also change the pitching moments of the airplane. The flight in this example was flown at forward CG. Taking the same measurements at the aft CG limit would have shown that the curves have flattened out and have a reduced slope. This means the longitudinal stability is reduced. If we continue to move the CG aft until we get a straight line like the red one, where the airplane flies at different speeds with the elevator in the same position, it would be neutrally stable. It would still be flyable, but this would be much higher workload and more difficult. Stalls would become dangerous. With a stable airplane, the CG is way in front of the airplane AC. On an airplane with a red line, the CG is in the same location as the aerodynamic center. We call this CG position the neutral point of the airplane. Normally the CG stays in front of the neutral point. The static margin defines how far the CG is in front of the neutral point. During the design process of the airplane, we try to calculate where the neutral point is in the longitudinal stability analysis, so that we can define a safe CG position for initial flight test, but this may not be totally accurate. I have only shown you here how to determine the wing AC, to find the whole airplane aerodynamic center, all the other things which influence the pitching moments of an airplane need to be added in, from airfoil selection to horizontal tail size to fuselage shape, engine power and propeller location. In the end, it is left to flight test to find out where the neutral point really is, preferably without actually flying the airplane with neutral stability. The neutral point can lie anywhere from 30% MAC to way further aft. It also is usually in a different position with power on than at idle. Typical static margins range from 30% and more on airplanes to less than 10% on gliders. So in the absence of a longitudinal stability analysis, I would initially keep the CG forward of 25% MAC. That's all for today in this video. In the next one, we move on to a new topic, the engine installation.